Animal bones are a relatively numerous resource available to archaeologists that are found in excavations that may indicate exploitation of resources over a period of time, be that wild animals during early prehistoric periods or domesticated animals during later periods. The principal use of animals has been to provide nutrition, but other resources such as the exploitation of wool, hides, and traction were also utilised. The aim of the zoo archaeologist is to use the evidence contained in the faunal assemblage to ascertain the species present and the various ways the animals were utilised, be that for meat, dairy, and other traction at a basic level. This can be done through the examination of the relative frequency of species and bone type present, the age and sex of animals exploited, evidence of utilisation from butchery and other such modification marks, and the presence of pathological indicators. These methodologies can be aided through the examination of morphological and biometrical analysis. A morphological indicator is basically the shape of the bone that can be used to distinguish bone type and species. Biometrical analysis is the measurement of the bones at certain standardized points to allow for comparative analysis to be undertaken. Age can be determined through tooth eruption and wear rates and the fusion of bones. Sex can be indicated through, for example, biometrics of metal cattle metapodals, that is limb bones, with a morphological indicator from the cattle pelvis. Through the examination of the above mentioned primary data, geoarchaeologists can determine the likelihood, for example, that through the presence of age female cattle, that dairying was of primary importance, or through the presence of aged sheep remains, that wool was utilised as a trading commodity. Zoo archaeology isn't just limited to the main domesticates, that is cattle, sheep, goat and pigs, as birds, fish and other mammals provided vital resources. Cats were skinned for the pelts, birds and fish provided meat and eggs during religious fast days, when meat from four-legged animals was prohibited. The utilisation of animals wasn't limited to just providing meat, but also other products such as milk, cheese, butter, wool and hides. Bones could be used to manufacture items such as combs, knife handles, gaming pieces and buttons. Horn cheese were used to man in the manufacture of lanterns and drinking vessels, and the hides from animals were used for the manufacture of various leather items such as shoes, saddles and containers, for example, firefighting buttons. There are simply too many uses to be listed here. The science of zooarchaeology is developing with recent applications of analysis of scientific methods, such as isotopic studies and protein analysis, details of which I'm going to further in due course. It is a developing and evolving aspect of archaeology with many possibilities of study. It has been stated that the Anglo-Normans had a significant impact on the Irish economy and agricultural practices including the introduction of new faunal species such as fallow deer, rabbits and pheasants. The expansion of urban centres enabled greater trading networks and hives of industrial activity. As with the early medieval period in Ireland, cattle continued to dominate the faunal assemblages of the medieval period. There is a variance in the relative frequencies between sheep, goat and pigs. Pigs, due to the fact that they were generally only exploited for their meat, were viewed as higher status animals which is reflected in the increased presence on more elite sites, such as castles. Throughout the medieval period, sheep became more frequent, which is taken as an indication of the rise of the wool trade in Ireland. Analysis has shown a trend in the medieval urban towns that older female cattle were recovered, which suggests that the meat from the dairying herds was being supplied to the towns, reflecting that the meat of the cattle was becoming of secondary importance to that of dairying. Linking information from historical records that stated pigs were occasionally prohibited in urban centres is that with the presence of very young pig remains suggests that the pigs were raised in towns during this period. Evidence derived from the data of the age of time of death for sheep suggests that they were utilised for both for meat and wool. There is a noted increase in goat horn cores during this period, however there is a notable lack of postcranial bones, that is bones from the body of the animal as opposed to the skull. This has led to suggestions that goat horn cores, likely along with their hides, were imported. It is noted, however, that there's predominance of female goat horns in urban contexts, which is suggested to be an indicator of dairying goats in urban centres. I will discuss goats in further detail later in this paper. The other domesticates, such as horse, dog, cat, and domestic fog, have been frequently found in medieval faunal cemetery, albeit at a relatively low frequency. Biometric data has shown that generally cats and dogs are smaller in urban sites than those found in rural sites, 
On the age of time of death, information suggests that they died at a younger age. Evidence for skinning marks on various bones of both cats and dogs has suggested the utilization of skins and pelts, which is largely an urban indicator. The consumption of horse meat was largely taboo, but horse bones have been found amongst other butchery waste, which has been suggested to indicate the consumption of horse meat during times of strife. Horses were largely owned by those of higher status and are deemed to have gradually replaced oxen and plowing around the 15th century. It appears from the faunal assemblages that during the medieval period, areas of the anglo norman occupation saw an increase in the exploitation of domestic fowl. The exploitation of deer, both red and fallow, was limited and was largely confined to those of higher status. My PhD research project is to delve into livestock husbandry of the urban medieval town of and port of Carrickfergus. The main focus will be to ascertain the exploitation of the main domesticates of cattle, sheep, goat, and pigs. This is hoped to give a thorough understanding of how Carrickfergus fed itself throughout the medieval period. Evidence will be gathered from zoarchaeological and anisotopic analysis, the study of historical sources, including documents and maps, and a study of the suburban and rural hinterlands surrounding Carrick Fergus. Carrick Fergus has been stated to be in the most excavated town in Ulster due to various development works since the 1970s. As a result, archaeological excavations have enabled the story to be told regarding the development of the town around the castle that was constructed in 1177 by the Anglo Normans. The development of the town was initially quick, with the finding of St Nicholas Church shortly after the construction of the castle and Woodburn Abbey showing that from the earliest phases of Carrickfergus, it was an important military and ecclesiastical centre and port. In the 1230s, the Franciscan Friary was also founded and the settlements surrounding the castle and the ecclesiastical centres grew. The presence of a mint established in the 1250s indicated the growing status and importance of the town at this time. Carrickfergus continued to develop throughout the medieval period being the major port in Ulster. The importance of Carrickfergus is evident in the production of three maps in the latter half of the 16th century, which can be viewed through the Irish Historic Plan Atlas. Three excavations within the time, changes in building structures has been found from the earlier timber structures to the later stone buildings. Excavations have also been found of evidence of the original medieval defensive ditch and the later constructed stone wall of which some still stands today. Despite numerous attacks on the town throughout the medieval period and numerous requests for funds, the building of the stone wall wasn't complete till 1615, though a section along the sea was completed in 1600. The fortunes of the Anglo Norman garrison town and port waxed and waned throughout the medieval period. What is not clear is was there a variance of food sources throughout the medieval period in Carrickfergus? Was the town fed by the intermediate hinterlands, or perhaps at times, Supplies were brought in from other English health centres in Ireland or from their field. Were the relations between English and Gaelic populations at a level of where there was trade on a regular basis? Or perhaps a combination of all these hypotheses? Also to be considered is the possibility of a change in the livestock husbandry methods during the medieval period in the area of Carrickfergus that may have been the result of contracted county boundaries through the latter part of the period when there was a resurgence of Gaelic control and power. An example of this would be the possibility that the husbandry of pigs changed from open areas and amongst woods, i.e. panage, to that of styes in the town itself. From various archaeological analysis of faunal assemblages of the town of Carrickfergus, cattle were found to be the most frequently represented species across all phases with the exception of the 16th and 17th centuries when sheep and goat were dominant. Presence of relatively high proportions of very young calves and older animals could indicate the exploitation of meat and includes the ex exploitation of veal as evidence in butchery marks found on calf bones. It is likely that the hides from these animals contributed to the large trade in animal hides from Ireland. The comparison of male to female ratios of cattle demonstrated that there was a higher proportion of females, which suggests in conjunction with the aging data that those cows that could no longer provide sufficient quantity of milk or cows were brought to the town for the consumers. There was a relatively high incidence of pathological indicators of degenerative joint disease found in cattle bones, indicating the utilization of these animals for traction. 
Sheep, goat were the second most frequently represented species of cattle throughout the medieval period, with the exception of the 16th and 17th centuries. Where possible, using morphological and biometrical indicators on horn cores and metapodals, it was clear that the urban context, goats were more frequent than sheep across all medieval phases. However, at this stage, it is not clear whether these horns and metapodals were evidence for horn working and trading in hides. Where the goat horns could be sexed, it was found that the majority were females, supporting the idea that goats were milked in urban areas providing fresh milk. In contrast to that of cattle, there was only a relatively small portion of the very young sheep goat in the faunal assemblage. It is likely that sheep goats were exploited for meat and dairy products as well as wool and hide production. The increase of age profile of older sheep goats during the 16th, 17th centuries may reflect the increase of wool production. Pigs were the least frequent of the main domesticates and occurred in relatively small sample sizes. There was a minimal amount of young juveniles found, majority of pig remains being at an age when meat production would have been at its peak. Overall, it was found that males were more frequent than females. It is surprising that more pigs were not found in character factors due to their known ability to, to successfully thrive in urban settings, feeding on waste from households and industries such as brewing and dairy. Horse, dog and cat remains were also found in varying quantities. Butchery marks were evident on those animals, as with the main domesticates. These butchery marks may include evidence of skinning for the production of hides and pellets. The exploitation of deer, hare, and rabbit were also evident, albeit in minimal numbers. There are numerous questions that arise from a zoo archaeological report, such as what husbandry methods were used, and were there any variations of this over time? An urban town is usually considered to be a consumer site rather than a producer. So where did the animals come from? Were the animals brought in from the intermediate suburban areas or from the hinterlands further afield, or perhaps from outside Ulster entirely? Sheep and goats are notoriously difficult to tell apart, with the horns and metapodals being the easiest of the bones to distinguish. However, if goats were being utilised for milk in the urban setting, can we find the rest of the remains of these animals through various methods? The following will give details of how scientific methods can aid in answering these questions. Isotopic studies within archaeology have been increasing over time, with new research being published on an increasingly regular basis. It was commonly used in the past to investigate dietary mobility patterns in humans, with analysis on animals forming baseline data, but is now increasingly being utilised on solely animals. I will give a very brief synopsis of how the most commonly analysed isotopes can be utilised in the study of zooarchaeology. Analysis of carbon isotopes gives indications of plant carbohydrates and proteins consumed. High carbon ratios can indicate the ingestion of marine freshwater resources, such as fish and seaweed. Changes of carbon can indicate dietary changes over time within a species, such as that of pigs from panage to urban control feeding. Carbon can also demonstrate the canopy effect where animals were fed in wooded areas as the values are lower than those fed in open fields. Nitrogen reflects the contribution of plant and animal protein in the diet. On a basic level, the higher the nitrogen values, the higher the trophic level of food consumed, distinguishing largely between plant and animal. Suckling animals are at trophic level higher than that of their mothers, as are those that consume marine diets. The consistency of Carbon and nitrogen values can indicate similar husbandry methods were carried out over a period of time, whereas variations can indicate diverse management regimes. Sulfur allows for analysis for contribution of marine influences on the diet, such as sea spray. Basically, it follows that the higher the sulfur values, the greater the impact of marine inundation. Strontium is used to indicate the age of rock, the geology of where the food came from. Patterns can be distinguished to give estimates of the mobility of livestock over a period of time. As teeth are formed at certain periods of an animal's life, sequential analysis can be used to indicate mobility over an animal's life. That is, if it was evolved in trade or other such movements, or if the animal remained in the same local area. Oxygen can be used to indicate seasonality and also has a relationship with the water ingested that can indicate mobility of animals is typically utilised alongside strontium as a secondary indicator of mobility. 
It must be noted that due to the large number of factors that cause variations in the values of the isotopes, that no study can be undertaken using just one isotope, and therefore a combination of isotopic analysis is required to enable the detailed study of the results. For the purposes of my research, I will be focusing on the analysis of carbon and nitrogen initially to give indicators of dietary patterns throughout the medieval period of the faunal remains of Carrick Fergus. To further this, any outliers will be subjected to other isotopic studies such as sulfur, oxygen, and strontium that may give indications of mobility of livestock as well as seasonality and marine influences. Zoo archaeology by mass spectrometry is a technique that uses collagen and other proteins in bones to identify the species of animals. It basically is the measurement of peptides in short chains of amino acids that is building blocks that are found in bone proteins, which is different for each species. It is described in literature as providing a molecular barcode that is unique to each species. It has many other applications, such as identifying eggshells, bone-crafted objects, leather and parchment, to name a few. It is particularly useful in the analysis of juvenile remains where biometrical data cannot be taken and the morphological indicators are not fully developed. It is also a great aid in identifying species when the bone is fragmented, resulting in the absence of indicators. Sheep and goats are, as mentioned earlier, notoriously difficult to distinguish with any great confidence. This leads to problems in distinguishing husbanding methods and it is known that these vary between the two species. As mentioned earlier at the beginning of this paper, there is evidence for goats within the Carrickfergus faunal assemblages. However, what the presence of these remains can actually be interpreted as is difficult given the standard methods of distinguishing between the species is generally limited to a couple of bones. As a result, I'm hoping to use in combination with morphological and biometrical analysis, the scientific method of zoos to aid in the distinction between the two species. This will hopefully aid in answering the question regarding the role of goats in urban centres, such as carg fragments during the medieval period. This has been a whistle-stop paper on zooarchaeology using medieval carg fragments as a case study. There is so much to be studied in zooarchaeology in Ireland, and with scientific techniques such as that as isotopes and zooms that are available to us, there are so many questions that we'll hopefully be able to answer as highlighted in this paper. Zooarchaeology is one of the many facets of archaeology that can aid in the study of the past. I've only scratched the surface in this paper, but I hope I've given an indication of some of the different aspects of zooarchaeology. It is an amazing time to be involved in zooarchaeology as the potential areas of study are almost endless. Thank you for listening.